Here we go. You're listening to Law and Gospel on this Monday, February the 13th, the day before Valentine's Day. And on Mondays, it is an opportunity to take a look at the readings for this coming Sunday. And we're going to be taking a look at the last reading for Epiphany because the Sundays thereafter and the Wednesdays where we have services at these churches is for Lent. This Sunday is referred to as the Transfiguration of Our Lord. It occurs on February the 19th in the year 2023. So we're looking forward to taking a look at Lessons Exodus chapter 24, 2 Peter chapter 1, and Matthew 17. Now, normally on Transfiguration Day, we look uh, quite a bit at Matthew 17. Why? Because this is when Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, led them up on a high mountain, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became white in light, and guess who was also there? Moses and Elijah. And then God the Father said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So that's normally what a lot of sermons will be talking about. But there's another reading from the epistle of 2 Peter chapter 1. It also talks about the transfiguration. So let's take a look at that for today. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter begins, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we went to a seminary where much of the Bible was considered mythical. In other words, what does that mean? It means that the people would use the knowledge that they had to talk about, say, the creation of the world. And they were unaware of evolution. Or they would talk about miracles and they were unaware that these were just natural causes. I mean, I, w I was taught at the seminary that when Jesus fed the 5,000 people, it was not because he took a little bit of bread and fish and created sufficient for 5,000 people. But when the little boy gave his bread and fish, it kind of embarrassed everybody, and they took their lunches out from under their robes and shared them with one another. That's what I was taught. So many of the miracles of Jesus were considered as myths, where the people would use the knowledge they had. But today, in our so-called scientific age, we would know how these miracles really took place. I remember when Jesus healed a man of demons and the demons went into the pigs and went down the hill. We were taught that the man actually was an epileptic. He went into a seizure and this is what scared the pigs. And they went down the hill and drowned as though pigs can easily drown in the water. But these myths were said again and again. I even had a professor who believed that the bones of Jesus were still in the grave, that he had been raised spiritually, but not physically. And this kind of mythology was taught again and again as people denied what the scripture said. Now, why does Peter say that they were not teaching devised myths about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Verse 16 continues, 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, this is a very important point. When we're trying to convince someone about the truth of Scripture, and they are unbelievers, there's no reason of man's mind that you can use to try and give them evidence for what the Bible says. Because as 1 Corinthians says, natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. They have to be informed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, every religion in the world is not revealed. It comes from the mind of men and is contrary to the Bible. Whereas Christianity is the only religion God revealed to his people. And this is really what the second Peter is talking about. When they say we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, and then in quotes, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice home from born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain now this is peter talking and when you go to matthew 17 the first verse says after 6 days jesus took with him peter and james and john his brother and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, where he was transfigured before them. So this is what Peter is talking about in his epistle, because in his epistle, it is referring to Matthew 17, where God the Father in verse five says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, and then he adds this, listen to him. Now, that is very close to what God the Father said at the baptism of Jesus, except that the listen to him was added at the transfiguration. And the reason that God the Father said that is because the disciples saw the divinity of Jesus in his glorious face, shining like the sun, his clothes becoming white as light. And it says, Moses and Elijah were talking with him. And the Bible says what they were talking about is his exodus. Now that's interesting. What's his exodus? It's his leaving earth after his resurrection and after his crucifixion. They were talking about that. It hadn't happened yet, but they knew it would for two reasons. Number one, Moses represents the first five books of the Bible. Elijah represents many of the prophetic writings of the Bible. And in the Old Testament, you will find the promise of Jesus going to die. Remember Psalm 22, pierced in hands and feet, but that he will also rise from the dead, as found in Isaiah and other passages. But the other reason they knew is that Jesus himself had said that to the disciples. I'm going to Jerusalem, where I will be put to death, but I will rise in three days. So getting back to Second Peter chapter 1, they are not only eyewitnesses to the transfiguration of Jesus, they are also ear witnesses as they hear the Father speak those words. 
This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Now, they heard this very voice. And then they continue in verse 19. And we have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention. Now, what are they talking about? They're talking about the prophetic words that Elijah and Moses knew, and particularly that the disciples knew from the mouth of Jesus. Now, they did not understand that. I I can prove to you they did not really believe that Jesus would rise from the dead because the disciples were hidden in an upper room after his crucifixion for fear of the Jews. And the women, including his mother Mary, were traveling to the grave on Sunday morning to anoint a dead body, wondering how they were going to roll away the stone from the grave. A stone which had been put there by Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, but then had been affixed somehow with maybe some kind of cement or whatever, so it could not be rolled away. And we learn from the book of Matthew that while the guards were watching this, an angel appeared, rolled away the stone, sat on the stone, and the guards became as dead men. They were so afraid and ran back and told the Pharisees what had happened. And they were told, after giving them money, tell the people that the disciples came and stole the body. So even the Pharisees knew that the tomb was empty, but they did not have faith to understand that he had truly risen from the dead. So, Peter is saying, we have something more sure. The prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Remember, Jesus even uses that kind of imagery. He says, nobody lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel so it cannot be seen. No, it's like a city on a hill. Everybody can see it, and the lights are on. And Peter says, the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that first of all, now this is so important, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. In other words, Many of the false teachings in religions throughout the world come from man's interpretation of what they believe has happened. But Peter is saying, no, this never is true. The interpretation of Scripture comes from someone else. And who is that someone else? Verse 21 of Second Peter 2. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. Now, what does that mean? Well, you hear that today in some preachers. They say, I had a prophecy that we need to move our church to this particular location. Or I have a prophecy, and then they'll say things that are not found in the Bible. These are false prophets. Jesus encountered them. Elijah encountered them. Moses encountered them. And of course, those false prophets led to the worship of idols. Idols made with man's hands and then kissed and sacrificed to. Well, Peter is saying, when we speak of scripture, this doesn't come from our own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. 
Now listen to the end of verse 21. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Wow. By the way, we talked about the Jehovah Witnesses who don't believe that Jesus is God or the Holy Spirit is God. Well, here you have a verse that men were inspired from God, spoke from God, carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is referred to as God. And Jesus, in that tremendous glory of the transfiguration, also is the glory of God. So Second Peter is really an important passage to look at, to remind us that these were eyewitnesses. That's all the evidence you need to convince someone to believe the message of Christianity. It reminds us of what we're going to be talking about this week on issues, etc., in dealing with the road to Emmaus experience, where Jesus talks to two disciples, and what is the evidence he gives for the reason why he was crucified and why he rose from the dead? He doesn't use human reason. He uses the Holy Bible. He quotes scripture. And as he quotes scripture, the Holy Spirit informs the people that are listening of the joy that they should have because Jesus was crucified for their sins and raised for their justification. No evidence outside of the Bible is possible to be used to convince anyone of that. The evidence comes from using the Bible. Now, when you use the Bible, it just sounds ridiculous. Uh, For example, as evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible says, that 500 people saw him after the resurrection. Now, that's ridiculous. Where where is the evidence for that? There, There is no such evidence outside the Bible. It just says it. And that's what we need to believe. Once God says something, that settles it. A believer needs no evidence from outside the Bible to convince him of the truth of the Bible. And an unbeliever, there is no evidence to convince them that the Bible is true. No, I did a number of adult instruction courses in dealing with bringing people into the church. And I can't tell you how many of them began by trying to prove that the Bible was true. They would use archaeology and other such things. Well, that, that's a waste of time. Because if you're talking to an unbeliever, until he receives faith, he cannot believe any of those things. But once he receives faith, then he believes whatever the Bible says. Uh, for example, scholars say whether was a place where Sodom and Gomorrah appear to have been destroyed. And it appeared that it was like volcanic ash that destroyed it, even though there's no volcano in the area. I don't need to have that evidence. The Bible says they were destroyed. That's sufficient for a believer. And it's also how one's faith increases. No interpretation of the Bible is given by the will of God, will of man, but instead comes from God himself. So there are actually so-called Christian scholars who deny the Old Testament teaching that Jesus would be born of a virgin. 
they try and do all kinds of things to get rid of the virgin birth. Even though the New Testament quotes those passages in regard to the birth of Jesus by the Virgin Mary. Once those are quoted, that's God's interpretation. And we don't need to listen to so-called scholars who attempt to say, no, there was no teaching of a virgin birth in the Old Testament. Yes, there was. And the New Testament proves it because it interprets that passage to refer to that. There is no interpretation of man that really is true of saying that God created the world in millions of years and that Adam and Eve were the two monkeys that God chose. That, that was something also that was taught at the seminary. That's ridiculous. The Bible is very clear. It was six 24-hour days. The, the science that we use is improper science that tries to give us the view of evolution. It just doesn't work. And people will come to know that on the day of judgment. And we pray that their rejection of God's word will not be sufficient enough to not allow them into heaven. But that's really between God and them. So even though on this transfiguration day, you have Matthew 17, I, I think it's really important to remind us of Second Peter chapter 1, where Peter says, we were eyewitnesses, we were ear witnesses to the glory of God. I want to say another thing about the transfiguration. You know, how many individuals appeared on the mountain? Well, there was Peter, there was James and John and Jesus, that's four. Then God the Father, that's five. And then also Moses and Elijah. So seven persons were on the mountain. And one can even include the Holy Spirit because the disciples were convinced of what they were seeing by means of the Holy Spirit. Because it says they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But I want to really emphasize that Moses was on the mountain. Now, why am I not emphasizing Elijah? Because the Bible is clear that Elijah was taken up into heaven in chariots of fire. There's no report of his death as happened to many, many people. But there is a report of the death of Moses and even his burial. Now, why am I making a point? Because your loved one is like Moses. Your loved one who has died in the Lord is still alive right now. As Jesus said to Martha when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he who believes in me shall never die. Now, he wasn't referring that your body would not die and be buried. He was referring to your spirit would never die, but immediately be brought to a living relationship with Jesus in heaven until the day of judgment, when your body will be restored to your spirit. The fact that Moses was seen on the Mount of Transfiguration proves that those who have died in the Lord are still alive in life. Now, many of them may be dead 
because they have chosen hell instead of heaven when God placed before them life and death. And they chose that because they did not believe the eyewitnesses of Scripture. Oh, they'll say, well, the Bible doesn't make any sense. Of course it doesn't make any sense because it's God's word and God's will. But we don't take a look at that as though it was a myth. It's not a myth because any time that God proclaims what has happened, then we as Christians believe it. Why? Because we are carried along by the Holy Spirit who gave us faith. Many of us at our baptism and many people, as they heard the word of God preached by missionaries or read the Bible, especially like the book of Romans or Isaiah, came to an understanding of Jesus Christ and their salvation, their forgiveness, and their gift that heaven will be their home. We're going to continue our conversation on tomorrow's Law and Gospel as we take a look at a hymn for transfiguration. O wondrous type, O vision fair. Join myself, Tom Baker, and Mark Smith to talk about that hymn. God Listen to Law and Gospel each you. weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law and Gospel, please make your check out to Law and Gospel and mail to Law and Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.